There's one heroic feat from a game developer that has stuck with me ever since I first read about it many years ago. But before we dive into that, it's worth remembering that game dev is hard. It's all smoke and mirrors designed to give the player the best experience possible whilst working within the constraints of the hardware, software and time available. With that in mind, imagine you're working on the next instalment of your hugely popular series and this time you've decided to add multiplayer. Now also imagine you're doing this back in the early 2000s. So you've survived the Y2K bug, but internet speed and connectivity isn't nearly what it is today. As such, a lot of games from that era are released without the ability to patch or update themselves. Imagine that, getting a brand new game and being able to play it straight away without having to wait for a massive patch. This is the situation that the devs from Insomniac Games found themselves in. They released Ratchet & Clank 3, Up Your Arsenal, without any ability to patch itself. And, as this game had a multiplayer component, players soon figured out how to cheat and abuse the system, and the devs couldn't do anything to fix this. And this is where our story begins, with an article written many years after the game was released. It's from one of the lead devs, and basically says that they were left with only one recourse, hack their own game. Basically, when the game starts, it sends an end user license agreement, or EULA, for the player to accept. This is downloaded from the network and copied into some static buffer which the game then renders. The interesting thing is that this copying is done via a call to stracopy, and if you know, you know. This is one of those C functions that you tend to avoid because of the potential security implications. It's pretty simple on the face of it, you give it a destination pointer and a source pointer and it copies characters from one to the other until it reaches the end, signified by a null byte. However, maybe you can see the problem here, there's no bounds checking, there's nothing to check that the destination buffer is big enough to store the source, and nothing to stop the source from just being indiscriminately copied. So this is what the developers did, they crafted a huge EULA and sent that over the network, which overflowed the static buffer and started overwriting other memory in the game, eventually overwriting everything in its path, including a pointer that is a callback for a particular network message. They used this overflow to overwrite the pointer and then sent that specific network packet. This caused the game to jump to any code of their choosing and essentially allowed them to gain control of the game and do any patching that was required. This blows my mind. Necessity really is the mother of all inventions. But enough of the theory, let's see if we can recreate it. So first off I'm going to use a PS2 emulator as this will give me a debugger and a bit more control over what's going on. Hmm. For legal reasons, you must obtain a BIOS from an actual PS2 unit that you own. Borrowing doesn't count. Let me get right on that and find a legit PS2 BIOS. Okay, so I've obviously just acquired a legit BIOS. Now it's time to get hold of a legit copy of the game. Time to find that EULA. I've been messing around for a bit, but I can't find the EULA anywhere. The article says that it's displayed each time it's launched. So I've now watched the first five minutes of every Ratchet and Clank 3 PS2 Let's Play. My Blargy and Snaggle Beast devours your mutant swamp fly. Oh yeah. Snaggle Beast devours your mutant swamp fly. <laughs> My Blargy and Snaggle Beast devours your mutant swamp fly. My Blargy and Snaggle Beast devours your mutant swamp fly. But I've just found this Ratchet and Clank 3 online pal event video and it shows a EULA in the multiplayer menu, which I guess makes sense. But it's also got a GitHub link. Turns out the game servers were shut down some time ago, but this group have diligently reverse engineered and re-implemented it. I'll leave a link to their GitHub and Discord below if you want to check it out. But I pointed my game at their public server and sure enough, I get their EULA. And a quick disclaimer from their GitHub. Depending on where you live, these downloads may or may not be legal. If using an illegal copy of the BIOS and or ISO, you agree to completely release the Horizon staff and community from any liability resulting from your actions. Good job I'm using a legit copy of everything then. Step 1 done, but how did I send a custom EULA? I briefly tried setting up my own server, but I couldn't get it to work and it's probably just an error on my end. The next thing is just to use their server and modify the traffic en route. So I've set up a tool called man in the middle proxy which will intercept all TCP traffic and allow me to use Python to introspect and modify it. 
I've captured a packet here with the EULA text in and there's some chuff around it, presumably the game specific protocol, but I can modify the text and see it in the game. So we can influence the game from the network. I've just tried copying this packet and sending it back multiple times, but unsurprisingly, this doesn't affect anything. Presumably I'm going to have to modify the packet itself for the game to accept more data. Looking at the source code for the reverse engineered server, I can see there's a policy response handler. This basically sends the policy back as a fixed size block of text. But if the policy itself exceeds the fixed size, it chunks it and it appends to each packet a zero if there's more data to come or one if it's the last packet. And we can see the final flag here in the data we captured. So back to the Python, let's duplicate that packet but modify the first one to have a zero at the end. And look at that, we can send multiple data. We need a better understanding of what this message looks like in order to craft our own. So let's dive into the C-sharp code from this Horizon server software. It seems that each message starts with a three byte header, one byte which specifies the RT message type, whatever that is, and two bytes for the message length. After that, we have two bytes for the message ID. This first specifies the type, which corresponds to one of these enums, and then the second byte is the actual type within that enum. Putting it all together, we can see that our policy message is a server app message, that's 293 bytes long, is a lobby message of type policy response, and contains message ID, three null bytes, a status, the policy, and the end of text integer, and a partridge in a pear tree. So I've now constructed a system that allows us to inject multiple of these policy return packets, all just containing the letter A, and I can see that the memory is being overwritten. The question now is, what do we overwrite and where is it? The limited article says they crafted a specific packet which triggers the exploit, but what packet? Using the Wayback Machine, I found an old article directly on the developer's website, which no longer exists. It's also in the form of a flash PowerPoint, so you know this is straight out of the early 2000s. It basically says the same thing as the article, but does reveal they use the file download packet. So looking back at the Horizon source code, we can see that they have a definition of this packet. So let's recreate that. And nothing happens. Literally nothing is happening. And if we just increase the buffer overflow, also nothing. After a bit more increasing, the game just crashes. It's landed in some invalid address, but there's no clue as to how it got here. I think we need to dive a bit deeper into the game's code. So I've run the game normally against their private server and I've used the emulator to make a snapshot at the point it displays the EULA in the UI. Now using this plugin, we can load that snapshot into Ghidra and now we can see the state of the game up until it downloads and displays the EULA, which means by searching for its text, we can find this fixed address it gets copied into. So scrolling down from here, we can see a lot of data. So presumably something here is a pointer that we can overwrite. I'm getting a bit overwhelmed at this point. I've theoretically done everything correct, but there's a thousand and one reasons why this won't work. Am I correctly intercepting and injecting traffic? Am I correctly creating a file download packet? Am I overflowing enough? Is my version of the game even vulnerable? Would this even work in an emulator? So many questions, and out of desperation, I even found a rip of an early beta version of the game. I was hoping that this would maybe have some debug symbol so I could track down the various message handlers. But alas, it just swore at me and left me none the wiser. I'm now pretty stumped, so I've actually reached out to one of the developers of the Horizon server. To my eternal gratitude, he has responded and provided a veritable treasure trove of useful information. First, he's confirmed a few questions I had about the network protocol, and then he gave me the offset of the pointer I was trying to overwrite, which would have taken me ages to try and find myself. Thanks, Dunalk Sharp. Thanks, Dan. So I set a breakpoint on the file download callback, and sure enough, my custom packet does trigger it. So we are on the right track. Next, doing some quick pointer arithmetic, I can see that the address I want to overwrite is really far away from the EULA buffer, but overflowing even more just causes a crash. I'm wondering if maybe we're overwriting something else important on the way, so I've dumped the valid memory from Ghidra and I'm sending that as my payload. Essentially, I'm overwriting the data with what I think is itself. Of course, we need to replace the null bytes as this would just cause Stracopy to stop. And now the emulator itself crashes. Honestly, I think I've pushed this about as far as I can. I suspect I'm up against some sort of limitation of the emulator. Either that, or there's some trick to sending mass data that I'm just not seeing. 
All is not lost though, as we can simulate the end effect by just patching the callback address to point to our buffer and then sending the triggering packet. So here we can see we're now trying to execute our buffer. I've got nothing really to patch, so I've just written some assembly to change a menu value to prove we have some effect. <sighs> that was a whirlwind tour of recreating a 20 year old exploit. But the low level fun doesn't end here. If you want to see more game hacking, then check out this next video.